Yeah, Jeff, then thank you very much for the interview. Um, I think it's been five, no, eight years since uh, we have met uh, last time. I'm not sure if you can remember. Eight years ago, I was working on your farm for about two months in April or May 2015. I guess you have a lot of volunteers, so um, maybe you might not remember the um, um, the face, but I can remember that you were at that time also um, working partly in Jordan on a project. Um, but before we head right in, for a short introduction of yourself, you're Jeff Lawton, you're one of the most well-known permaculture consultants and designers, teachers and speakers worldwide, and you're active for over 40 or nearly 40 years now. And um, you do projects all over the world and have your own permaculture farm in Australia, the Zaituna farm. Hello, Jeff. That's right. I'm in Jordan right now speaking to you as well. Nice one. Are you in Jordan on the same project that you worked on in 2015? Yes. Yeah, nice same project. One. Can you tell us a little bit about it? What is it about? Uh, well, it, it, the main project is called Green in the Desert. And we have a demonstration site here that's also an education center. Um, we also have um, an Airbnb for people to experience what it's like to uh, stay in a permaculture oasis with all the infrastructure, including um, solar power and uh, compost toilets and uh, reed bed gray water. Uh, we also have an organic cafe and um, a pretty high quality organic restaurant as well. So this. All of that is is um, used by the students when they take a course here. Uh, we teach a permaculture design certificate course every year, and um, and we have uh, following that we have a two week practical internship program where people can come and um, not only take the course, uh, come and do a practical workshop, or just come for the practical workshop. Um, the project's extended um, into. Um, land adjoining land uh, where i'm talking to you now we're in the state-of-the-art desert house which is straw bale um, and mud brick so we have uh straw bale outer walls uh mud brick internal walls um a solar heat exhaust chimney and um uh, we also have a uh, natural swimming pool there's a swimming pool we renovated from a conventional swimming pool that was more or less dilapidated and we converted it into a, a natural swimming pool and um and we've extended uh, desert food forests and gardens around this area as well so and there's a third a third block of land and um that we also extended into and um and other areas around us very close by um people moving in and doing very similar things so it's kind of turning into a little uh, permaculture neighborhood here in the Dead Sea Valley. It's great to hear. And you mentioned that you have a natural pool there. If I think about Jordan, I have this arid landscape in mind. Um, how do you sustain a pool in a very dry landscape? Well, it's it's filled with water that's drinkable and um, it's um, heavily shaded um, to reduce the evaporation. And um, it runs just on 20 watts of electricity. So it's a very small amount of electricity. Um, and um, the water is uh, cycled through uh, a plant gravel system uh, with bubbler lift pumps. And um, works very well, actually. And it's very much appreciated here in the summer. Hmm. Definitely. I would also appreciate it, um, to be honest. Um if you think about the climate of Jordan compared to the climate of Australia, the subtropics, and also the temperate climate where we are here um, in continental mid-Europe, what is the most important thing to watch out for in permaculture, would you say, in the subtropics compared to temperate climates like in Germany? All right, well, where we are is, is definitely desert. We're 400 meters below sea level. Um, so it's equivalent because of the lack of altitude, to about 28 at latitude 28 north or south of the equator. Uh, but it's a very low rainfall. Um, we have uh, subtropical temperatures in the winter, but we have uh, extremely high temperatures here in the summer. So when you're in an arid landscape like this, which is very small rainfall and high temperatures, everything is an anti-evaporation strategy. When you're in the subtropics, uh, you have a lot more moisture 
because your summer is when it's wet and your winter is when it's dry. And um, you have uh, um, a climate that's a little bit like a temperate climate summer in winter. But um, your, your summer temperatures are more tropical and you have tropical summer rain. So your, your winter climate starts in the tropics, um, has a frost in the middle of the winter, uh, frosty nights sometimes. Uh, just very light, but enough to affect plants and, and, and the design of your house. And, um, and the springtime, which is the end of winter, is dry and hot. And often the summer rains don't come early, so you're, you have a kind of desert spring. So when you're in the subtropics, it's a matter of managing all those variations through, throughout the year. But mostly you're leaning a little bit towards the tropics from a Mediterranean type climate. So the Mediterranean is definitely rain in winter and hot, dry in summer. And as you go north, you get into those temperate climates, which get colder and colder in winter. Further away you get from the ocean, the colder in winter and the hotter in summer in all situations. So as you get into the temperate, you have a you have more demand to get most of your crop production in summer and less in winter and more emphasis on keeping the house um, and it, and it warm and, and uh, less energy consuming. So designing a house that lets the light in, um, has thermal mass to warm itself, has minimum drafts, maximum insulation, and thermal mass to hold the heat. So you're very orientated towards the light, the heat, um, gaining heat, and um, getting maximum production through the summer. But the thing with the temperate climates is you have very long summer days and very gentle sun, really, compared to the tropics, subtropics, and even deserts. So you can maximize your long day length, um, low sun angles, um, and um, and get the most out of that summer period. And in the winter, it's more about uh, short days, low temperatures, and, 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 and being warm and comfortable in your living conditions. Nice one. And um, I remember one of my first mistakes when I tried to design my own small permaculture design of my home garden in Germany while I was at your farm in Australia was that it was just taking what I saw in the subtropics and applying it to the temperate climate. And then after a while, I recognized that it doesn't make really sense to do exactly the same because you should adjust it to, as you said, to the situation that is there. Um, but mistakes happen every now and then. And can you give us an example? Have you ever done a mistake in your designs? And um, can you give us maybe an example of that and how you fixed it? I'm sure I've done many over the years. <laughs> Um, climate is the first priority on a scale of permanence. So um, although we all talk about climate change and it's a big discussion today, the climate is generally warming, but we're getting very erratic variations. So we're getting the hottest day and the coldest day and the windiest day, but every day on record, everywhere at once. It's extremely erratic. Generally, the climate is getting a little bit warmer um, and it seems to be continuing on that warming path. But the climate is still more or less locked within the climate types. And if you don't design correctly the climate, you make a big mistake. So you need a lot more shade in the desert. And often we haven't created enough shade. And often we're, we're teaching courses where we're trying to teach people techniques and um, showing how to um manipulate the organic matter and we can do it here a little bit too early and the rain the winter rain hasn't started the cooler temperatures haven't kicked in and it can be very stressful so when i haven't emphasized the importance of timing your actions to climate so in the in the tropics um in the amazon actually in the peruvian amazon we um we didn't emphasize that enough um, on a project. And uh, the men 
um, just managing the project, they didn't want to look too different from everybody else. So normally what people do there is they cut at the end of the wet season and they know the dry season's coming. It's a wet, dry, tropical landscape. So half the year it's wet, half the year it's dry. When you get a little bit away from the equator, but they're still in the tropics called the wet, dry tropics. So they all cut. They all cut their mulch. They cut their extra vegetation. At the end of the wet, where it's nice and green and lush, let it dry in the dry season, then burn it. We emphasize no burning. We want organic matter to benefit the soil, but we didn't emphasize that you change the time of year that you cut. And we got back to our project after six months and everything was dry and the growth rate was very small. And that's because we should have told them, you don't cut at the end of the wet and burn at the end of the dry or mulch at the, end, at the start of the dry. You wait with all the vegetation shading the ground during the dry period and you wait until the rainy season starts and cut because in the rainy season you have cloud cover, you have rain, and it's much better to feed the soil with your organic matter and your living mulches at the beginning of the rainy season and not at the end. And that would mean that the local people we were, where we were starting this project will be doing something even more different, not only not burning, but putting mulch on the ground, um, but not cutting and at, at the same time of year. Um, so that was a 12-month mistake. It was one of the biggest mistakes I ever made. And it was very hard because it almost took us one year back. We had to start again and say, now we'll, cut, we'll plant these really fast-growing trees that fertilize the soil, these very fast-growing plants, do not cut them until after the dry season, until the rain starts. And that's the same in every climate. Um, in, the, in the temperate climate where you are, um, you don't cut your mulch, you don't cut your shady shade-providing trees until the autumn rains, after the dry period at the end of summer. Because in, in Germany, you're in Germany, aren't you? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you have evaporation over rainfall at the end of summer. Now, in August, early September, you get the, the end of the summer when it gets hot enough and dry enough to actually be more evaporation than rainfall. You need the shade for that period. And then you cut when the autumn rains start and your winter rain and your winter decomposition breaks down that mulch, breaks down that organic matter. And by the time you get to spring, they all re-sprout and, and grow during the summer period. And then when you get to the period when you get evaporation over rainfall, you've got nice shade cover. And it actually, it actually can look quite subtropical for, the, for that period of, of the year. At the end of summer, with nice lush shade, it can look very exotic in the temperate climates. It's nice to hear, especially for the people who like to have an... Um... A nice looking garden, something exotic um, might mm. uh, motivate them to also leave it standing. Do you have some more examples um, focusing on the temperate climate? What the most um, often made um, mistakes are that people do when they design their garden into a permacultural project? I think you, you still need to emphasize on um, the rehydration of the soil through earthworks. So putting in water soaking systems um, are still beneficial because um, a lot of people think, well, you get enough rain, um, but you don't get heavy rains. You don't get a lot of volume. You just get regular small rains. So your rainfall is very small compared to what's required in the hot climates not to be a desert. So if you get less than a meter of rain in the tropics, it looks like a desert. A meter of rain in the temperate climate is extreme. You know, it, you know, you very rarely get over a meter of rain because your rains are constant but quite light. But you need to soak the soil for the tree roots. You need to be 
getting water into the ground at deep levels. And it takes seven years to fully saturate the soil. So although it would appear that you, you don't really need extra moisture because it feels like there's, you know, there's a lot of rain, but it's not a lot of volume. It's just quite constantly <laughs> light rain or drizzly rain. Um, and there's a great benefit to, to harvesting rainwater with contour soakage systems and allowing that to soak deeply into the soil. And every year for seven years, you get a little bit more soakage. And that's, that's the deep water that feeds your tree roots and especially the large canopy trees like your chestnuts and your large productive walnuts and, and big productive trees, but all the trees. So their deep tap roots allow the harvesting of minerals, high quality minerals, making very highly nutritious fruit and nut production. And that can be like your main nutrient dense food, your long living trees. It's not really the annual vegetable garden. I mean, there's great benefits to annual vegetable gardens. And, and many people think there's not a lot of diversity you can grow in the, the, the temperate climates, but you can grow at least 200 perennial food plants in your climate. Then a lot of them aren't sold in the shops in the supermarket because they don't fit monoculture agriculture. But there are many people in permaculture that get two to 300, up to 300 perennial food plants in a garden. That's trees, bushes, and herbaceous plants. Now, I'm not talking annuals now. I'm talking plants that live for many years. Um, Eric Tonesmeyer, um, in Holyoke, Massachusetts, which is a climate that gets two foot of snow, half a meter of snow or more every year, so it's cold. He trialed 300 perennial fruit plants and settled on the best 200. So a lot of people don't realize that potentially our gardens can be 800 times more diverse than they were 150 years ago. There are way more potential food plants we can include in our gardens and our small farms. That's an enormous benefit to our health. That's an enormous diversity of high quality nutrient, which will benefit your health and your longevity, how long you live and how vital you are, how much vitality you have. Yeah. Now that you mentioned all the diversity that you can grow in such a small garden, I have uh, just to think about um, that with the changing climate, the plants that you can grow in your garden also change. What do you think about taking plants from a, from a different climate or from a different location on the earth and introducing it into your home garden? That's all we've ever done forever. Carrots come from Afghanistan. Potatoes come from the Andes. Eggplant comes from the Middle East. You know, we, we've always done that and we need to continue doing it. But because of the climate variation in change, you need plants from a colder climate and a drier climate and a more tropical climate. As much as you can stretch the climate, because you may have the coldest winter ever next year, or you may have the hottest, driest summer ever next year, or you may have the wettest summer or winter ever. Now, mainly you'll talk about uh, summer because that's your main growing period. So it's not that it's changing all in one direction. Yes, it's getting a little bit warmer generally, but that doesn't mean you won't have the coldest, you know, summer ever or the wettest summer ever or the driest or hottest. It's, it's, it's going in all directions. So managing slight microclimates, managing microclimates in your garden and especially perennial plants, plants that keep growing, they might go, they'll go dormant in winter, then come again in the, in, in the springtime. That's where you've got more security 
and also often more nutrition. Let's take uh, take a step back for a second. And um, you learned about permaculture by Bill Mollis himself, right? Back in the 80s. So this is now about 40 years ago. Um, correct me if I'm wrong. But yeah, I, I my journey in permaculture started in 1980 when I emigrated to Australia in 1979 from England. So in, in 1980, I started to get involved um, with a local uh, group who were very early, um, a very early community, a group um, who started a permaculture kind of club. And um, in 1983, I took my first course with Bill Mollison. Before that, I took a, a small course with Max Lindegger, who was a Swiss immigrant and a, and a civil engineer. So my very first introduction to permaculture as an education was through Max Lindegger and then Bill Mollison in 1983. What has changed since then? Since the 80s, there's much time passed. Did permaculture change in a way? Nature doesn't change. It's permanent. The systems and principles and laws of nature will always be the same. So the basic laws and principles have not changed. Um, but the... There's a few variations in design. Of course, we didn't have the internet and we didn't have mobile phones and smartphones. Um, we definitely didn't have AI <laughs> answering a lot of questions. So our access to information has changed radically. Um, we didn't have things like satellite mapping and LIDAR mapping, which I use all the time now. So... Um, there hasn't been a lot of changes in design. Um, small, very small increments of change have happened. Um, I now use things like swivel pipes in swales to reduce water um, through... Um, I, I, I drain my water harvesting systems in major floods. Maybe that's an evolution that's happened because we're getting unpredictable weather um there's one or two technology changes in um housing like solar has become very much more advanced solar energy and battery systems um inverters uh, battery technology has really changed um those are th those are big differences um surveying technology when you're on the ground, we're using laser levels where we didn't have laser levels before. Just a few things like that have changed. The main principles will never change. Decomposition is decomposition. The diversity and connection between elements in nature are always the same. Water's still moving at right angle to contour and only falling downhill and not going uphill for free. So, you know, the vast majority of permaculture design is exactly the same. You can read 40-year-old permaculture magazines and, and written articles from 40 years ago, and they're still uh, absolutely relevant today. Mm. Yeah, there's also the impression that I get when I read uh, Bill Mollison's Permaculture Designer's Manual. And I, I see that uh, the technology, did, there was a very different situation. For example, wind turbines were the energy source that was more promoted, and solar, solar did not exist, at least was not shown to a prominent um, degree. But so what do you say to people, let, let me frame it differently, there are some people that perceive permaculture as something uh, backwards, um, basically going back to the roots, using no new technology. Now in your explanation, you use a lot of technology. What would you uh, tell these people? Oh, well, they've, they've got a misconception of uh, the state-of-the-art design science that governments are using, the United Nations aid programs are using, and massive corporations are using. We're employed all over the world for some of the biggest companies on the planet. And um, it's a growth industry. It's enormous. It's, it's growing exponentially, but it always has done. Right from the start, we could never keep up with the inquiry. We don't have to go looking for customers. Um, so, and, and we, we knew that was happening, and we knew we would never keep up. Um, luckily... The amount of permaculture action out there on the internet is massive. 
and it's in all countries. So the amount of technology that now provide education, there's a big change. Our online education is massive. My online course, I could only teach 30 to 50 people maximum on, on a face-to-face -face course on average and get a good result. And now I'm teaching one and a half to 2,000 people on every course. So I'm teaching 10 years worth of students every year. And I've been doing that for six years. So I'm 60 years in front in my educational potential. Um, I have 800 videos on one online course. And I actually service 35,000 questions with 12 teacher's assistants. That's not possible face-to-face. -face. The inquiry is absolutely enormous. And, and it's, um, I can't see that changing. Hopefully, we're in time um, to change the world in a positive direction. Um, we're working with town planners. We're working with city developments. There isn't anywhere where we aren't working that's ethical. Mm. And at my time, when I was working at your farm for um, a couple of weeks a month, um, I recognized there was some questions of some volunteers uh, that regularly popped up. They were uh, asking, where is the productivity? So that um, on your farm and as a tuna farm, it's a showcase where you show different kinds of techniques that you can use. But people were wondering, where is the massive productivity that um, conventional farms have? Do you think permaculture can service big farms? No. And we don't want to either, because they're rather evil, and they should be illegal, and, and kind of considered something like witchcraft. And that's probably what will happen in the future. Industrial agriculture was always a bad idea. It's probably the worst idea humanity's ever come up with. Um, and, and probably the most damaging, even more than, 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 than warfare. Um, so it's kind of industrial agriculture is kind of war on the earth and, and war on nature. And uh, obviously it was always going to fail and is failing miserably right now. And the more technology that's thrown at it, like genetic engineering, the more it fails. Um, if you do an energy audit on the uh, industrial agriculture, it's very obvious that it's highly inefficient. And um, there's massive amounts of energy thrown at it uh, for very little value in product. And if you uh, make an assessment in relation to the area of production, um, to the nutritional quality, it's extremely low compared to permaculture systems. So um, on the equivalent area, and I don't mean the same area, on the equivalent area, repositioned as urban and perimeter urban agriculture, we can produce the same amount of nutrition on four to six percent of the same equivalent area. So all of those large farms can just go back to nature and help moderate the irregular climate, which they will do if you start putting in the environmental buffers that were once there, ecosystems that absorb the solar energy that enters the earth. We're all solar collectors. That's what we are. We, but we survive on food that was come from the energy of the sun, either through animals that ate plants or plants themselves, which work with photosynthesis, taking the sun's energy and converting it into edible material of some type. Now, if you, if you convert that into productive ecosystems, all of our nutrition can be grown in urban and perimeter urban agriculture, leaving an outer um, larger area around perimeter urban agriculture for productive forestry products and rangeland management of large animals. And it's, it's, a, it, it's, it's a win in every way because it's meaningful employment, it's valuable use of land, it's an absorption of all our waste product from cities, all our wastewater, all our waste organic material, and we shouldn't have any other waste that isn't organic, really. Even the pollutants can be absorbed by biological systems and then reused through uh, soil amendment systems. So it's just a matter of design and, and redesign of cities. Now, that's a major job, but we're looking for work anyway, and we're looking for meaningful work. And sooner or later, that is the future. Otherwise, we don't have a future. We don't have a choice. There is no choice. 
There's no other game in town. And it's it's actually being realised. We're still playing around with silly technologies, uh, but if you actually just put an energy audit over it and say, well, for the energy going in, for the nutrition coming out, and you can calorif you can use a calorific scale to judge how much energy is produced through the calorie potential, you can see that our systems are way more efficient and way more productive. In small urban food forest systems, we quadruple the best production in industrial agriculture. So the smaller the area, the more production per square meter. Uh, small urban systems produce 13 to 20 tons to the hectare as a minimum. And agriculture comes nowhere near that. But that's food that can be produced for the people in the region, so it's completely fresh, extremely diverse, and has an enormous nutritional quality. When you so said it's a long that, answer, but no, no, it's, it's, nature's not simple. So there has to be, it, it, it's a reasonably complex answer, but we love that complexity. That's what we love about rainforests. That's what we love about walking in the countryside. That's what we worry, love about woodlands and rivers and lakes and natural coastlines. That's why up until we're four years old, everything's wow, except half of the four-year-olds are watching the screen now. But we still love to go out in nature. Well, if your whole landscape is surrounded by natural productive ecosystems, even as adults, we live in a paradise where everything is just wonderful. Um, why wouldn't you do it? it? It's very sellable. We have eight bedrooms here that are Airbnb in a straw bell mud brick building. And, and people come all the time to experience it. They want to know what it's like to live in a system like this. And they go away amazed. And we're in a desert, so it stands out. But it's just the same wherever you are. I mean, there are so many fork-to-plate restaurants out there. There are so many um, destination uh, dining restaurants which grow all their own food. That's a very fashionable thing today. It's all coming online so quick. Hopefully we're in time, you know, uh, before major um, systems collapse. Um, if, if we only need a meteorite shower to knock out some of our, a large, large amount of our satellites and we'll have a, a complete crash of civilization. We only need a financial crash of some type. Water and food security is, 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 is very vulnerable. And we saw that with, with COVID. Very small things, you know, can disrupt our very vulnerable systems. They're extremely clever. I mean, nothing's in storage. Everything's in a shipping container about to arrive somewhere exactly on time. As soon as it's disrupted, everything's delayed by six months or a year. And we experienced that. We experienced that during the, the, the pandemic event. Whatever you think of that, it doesn't really matter what you think of it. You should look at the supply, rain, the, the, the supply line disruption and think, well, <laughs> why, have we, why have we made the world so vulnerable? Why have we done this? It is extremely efficient technology. But it, it, it's it's enormously vulnerable, and um, we've come up with some very silly ideas. Whoever thought it was a good idea to grow most of our food on poisons, which are based in estrogen, which is it's an endocrine disruptor that that affects our fertility. So we may just end up in the next few generations having a complete decline in in, in population. Not a population growth, but a massive re decline. Now, our economy only exists if we have an increase in population. It won't, you know, it can't, it can't exist if, our, if the global population starts to decline rapidly, which could happen quite easily. There's enormous amounts of endocrine disruption through the estrogen-based biocides. We're all in an estrogen drench. And the older people are not so affected as the next generation coming. Each generation is getting more affected. 
when we hop back for a second to the, the what you said about large farms, the, um, those that should not exist on a conventional under um, conventional base, is there a size of a permaculture project that is maximum or that is best? No, not exactly. Um, we have very efficient systems that are only 60 square meters, which is very small hmm. in urban areas. And we can kind of easily go out to 100, you know, 75 hectares. You're talking hectares? Or uh, yeah, acres? Yeah. Yes, hectares. Yeah, say 70, 70 to 75 hectares. Um, it is, it's kind of a, a maximum size, more or less. Could be varied a little bit. <clears throat> will depend on the landscape form. So when you when in the scale of permanence, climate comes first, and then the landscape form comes second. And water comes, soil actually comes last. Soil is not so important because we ecosystems build soil and improve soil. So we're actually, if your if your permaculture system is not maintaining fertility or gaining fertility, and and maintaining the volume of soil or increasing the volume of soil, you're going extinct. You're, 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 you're unsustainable. So it's, it's hard for one family to manage more than um, 70 to 75 hectares of productive land. If a lot of the land is too steep for you know, highly productive activities, it's probably in forestry. It's, probably, it's either in grazing if it's not too steep or pasture, rangeland, or it's steep, it's in forestry. But for the highly productive landscape, it's not too steep and it's reasonably usable. Most families won't manage more than 70 hectares. So that's a kind of outer perimeter ag uh, urban agriculture. You, you need to look at your large areas of population, your large populations as having very integrated urban agriculture and A, a ring of agriculture around the outside, which is perimeter urban, and then your larger farms are on the outside of that, but they don't go very far. That you said um, we can build our own soil. So I heard a lot about biochar as something to add to your soil to improve its fertility. Have you worked with it? Do you have any experience or um, yeah. thoughts about it? Yeah. Yeah, it's great in the wet tropics. If you're six degrees in the equator, it's pretty good stuff. Outside of six degrees in the equator, where you get a double equatorial rain season and huge raindrops, it's not so useful. It's just um, high-rise, dense population for bacteria in the soil. Now, there's 50 million genus of bacteria, we think, and we don't know much about the soil and the soil life. And now we're, we're re revisiting it after... Over 150 years. So in the 1850s, um, we kind of um, abandoned studying the life in the soil because it's so complex. There's more life in the soil than there is above the soil. And four out of five living organisms on this planet are soil nematodes. So because we can't see them, you need a microscope to look at them. You need a, a 200 magnification microscope to see the beneficial fungi a 400 magnification microscope to see uh, protozoas, nematodes, and flagellates, and you need a 600 times mag magnification microscope to start to see bacteria. <coughs> so we ignore it, but at our peril, because you don't feed plants organically. It's not possible. You do that with chemicals by forcing them to drink the soluble chemicals. You feed the soil life, and the soil life feeds the plants. So in recent years, it's become the cutting edge of agriculture. Now, ecosystems have been building soil forever, and that's where our soil comes from. It comes from the enormous amounts of diversity of life that exists in pristine ecosystems. That's why we cut down forests to find good soil, and we've been doing that for too long. And now we've got a regular climate. So we have to put back ecosystem functions integrated through our productive landscape so we have enough of that activity to maintain fertility and soil 
physical material. And if we're good, we increase fertility and increase the volume of soil on our farms. And then we're farming forever and we're producing very high quality production and very high quality nutrition. Do you have any tips for our listeners um, on how to best feed and grow your own soil? Organic matter, manure, and a mixture of water and air makes you high quality compost. So you need at least a third of a cubic meter of manure, a third of a cubic meter of high carbon material that needs to have a high, large surface area. So it needs to be shredded or cut up into small size. And then a third of a cubic meter of green fresh materials mixed together with the right uh, moisture and aerated with turning. And you can make high quality compost within 18 days. And I've made many documentaries on that. Um, and uh, that's the basics. And you really only need the basics. You can go to very high quality compost and you can make oxygenated compost tea if you want to spread that further. But there's more technology involved there. You don't have to go to that far. Now, fast carbon pathways are fast growing species that actually take the sun's energy and quickly convert it into carbon materials. And that's all you need. The reason you have biochar, if you want to open up to the sunlight in the wet tropics, you're making your soil very vulnerable to raindrop impact. And the little bacteria gets washed through the shallow soils. Tropics have very shallow soils. The temperate climates have the lush, deep soils. So where you are in, in Europe, in Northern Europe, you have very high quality, deep soils. And you have light rain. So you don't have to worry about the, the microorganisms, particularly the bacteria, washing your way. So biochar is a little bit like a waste of time. It's like, it's a bit of a distraction. And also, if you start putting high carbon materials into the soil, um, it, 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 it's kind of, they need to take the nitrogen from the soil to break down the carbon. So if you start putting hugel culture around, it only works with the opposite, where it's really cold. So if you get into the really cold climates, you can bury wood under your gardens to hold more moisture because it breaks down in the cold winter whenever it rots, whenever it's like cold and damp and rotting. But that's not the time of year growing. So when you're growing, you're growing in summer, and that's when you need the nitrogen. It's drawing the nitrogen from the soil to break down the carbon in winter. Don't do that in the Mediterranean or the tropical climates because the wet season is the summer and that's when it's growing. You don't want to draw nitrogen when you want to grow at the same time. So it's climate is really important to get your te techniques right. That's where we started. But get into composting, get into decomposition. If you don't have a lot of room, get into worm farming. And and on and um, bakashi compost, which you can do inside in your kitchen, it, it's uh, it's it's uh, partnering with organisms again. You're always partnering with life systems, whether you're partnering with organisms in the soil and you're partnering with living systems above the soil. You're facilitating life-rich events. That's what the design system does for you, and it becomes a relationship, like a human relationship. They're complicated, um, and, and you have to work with them. Uh, but when you get them right, they're wonderful, and you feel very privileged to have long-term refined relationships with living systems. It's a wonderful thing. You have to decide that you want to be part of nature. So you have to be, you have to want to be part of nature, like we always should be, we always have been. And then you have to do the system. You have to work with the system to <clears throat> become a beneficial part of nature, to be a, a positive element. And then you have everything. You have paradise. You have really good health. You, you are wealthy because you have a system that gives you clean air, clean water, sensible housing, warmth, friendship, and community. And that's true wealth, not money. Money is just an exchange system. It's got nothing to do with wealth. There are a lot of poor billionaires. 
we all think we need money to have things. And then once we have money, we can do things and then we can be somebody. You've got it upside down. That's completely wrong. You need to be part of nature first and then do what you need to do to be a beneficial part of nature. Then you have everything. You have everything you could ever want. So we need to I'm, – I'm writing a children's book to explain this to children and parents of how to engage in this process because you'll find children – they they love this. They, they 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 sort of have this innocent connection to nature, and older people have a reflection on their life, and they get it as well. It's all the people in the middle or working meaningless jobs who don't get it because they haven't got a time anymore. They're time poor, right? And and that's very sad. I have one one last question. Now that you talked about all the interaction between different organisms. One great example is the food forest that you also mentioned earlier. I remember back in 2015, I was working also on your farm on some swales where there were food forests planted, I think a few years old. How is the development of such a food forest? Is it something that you could advise for? Um, I don't want to say every permacultural project, but every second per permacultural project? Oh, definitely. I don't think there's many permaculture projects that don't have some um, food forest type assemblies. Um, although in urban situations, they're often very small and, and around the perimeter, but they can be the whole garden as well. Um, the, the systems at say tuna farm are, are huge now. There's, there's over 10 hectares and now there's eight houses. So we're a small eco hamlet. So we are a community. Um, we still have our education center. Um, they're very large. They're, they're areas that we've now cut a lot of the support species out into coppices. They regrow every year, but the main canopy is the large fruit trees. And they're very beautiful. Um, they're very beautiful environments. And um, they're going on indefinitely. They'll, they'll go on for hundreds and hundreds of years. Um, so I think people love... Uh, food forests, there, there, there's a link between humanity and, and feeling very contented and peaceful in, in a forest. And when it's a productive forest that continuously has seasonal production of fruit, um, it, it's, it's a wonderful system to um, live in amongst and be linked from what, from on Zaytuna Farm, uh, we can walk from one house to another without coming out un from under the canopy of food forest, really. Um, we have corridors on contour of food forest right across the property. There's almost four kilometers of food forest. But recently, I don't know whether you saw my videos, I was documenting food forests in Yemen, uh, in Oman, in the Middle East, that were 4,000 years old. The water has been running for 4,000 years from underground canals that were dug and springs were brought to the surface and still run. And the food forests are 4,000 years, and one was 25 kilometers long. Wow. And they're still running today and still working today, and the soil is perfectly fertile. And we could diversify those food forests with lots of species from similar climates around the world, and they could be even more um, diverse and even more productive in the variety of uh, species. So I've, I've made extensive videos, wherever I know there are systems like that, I've, on my own, and I've financed my own trips to go and take these videos and, as, as examples for people to give them hope of this is all possible. Imagine, imagine Germany having food forests that, that would be, we know, uh, that would last for thousands and thousands of years. How, how How hopeful would that make the children feel that we, we, we're secure? We, we know we've got production and it's healthy and nutritious and our soil is stable and they're going to go on for thousands of years. We have those examples around us. How would that make you feel, right? You know, how contented and, 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 and secure would you, would you feel instead of growing up feeling it's all hopeless and the world's going to end because 
you know, everything's going wrong. And, and, and children know the world's unhappy, the world's hurting, and, and it's not a good situation. And, and, and there's a lot of bad news. So they're just numbing themselves by looking at screens. It's like the new drug. Um, instead of getting outside and, and listening to frogs and, 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 you know, listening to bird songs and understanding the sounds, the smells, you know, um, the, the beautiful patterns, the, 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 the beautiful feel of, of different textures, you know, the tastes. You know, the, a, lot of, a lot of children don't even know what real good food tastes like. Um, they're sort of numbed with junk food and sugar. Um, so there's a lot of educating um, children to really um, learn to use their senses. Uh, do you know that a, a concert pianist has 10,000 times more sensitivity in their fingerprints than the average person, their fingertips, um, from playing the piano so well, are 10,000 times more sensitive. You can do that with all of your um, senses, the way you see, the way you smell, the way you hear, the way you touch, the way you taste, all of these, you know, and, and, and this gives you a, a way to be, to have great understanding of the natural world. So, this is what we need to do, and I, I think we can do it. Uh, we have the information age. That's how we're talking together now from me and Jordan <laughs> and you and Germany. <laughs> it's a wonderful tool, and uh, I'm hopeful. It definitely um, is. And what also motivates me or um, brings up a lot of hope is that to see that there is a 4,000 years old food forest that someone, some people have put there. Someone has yeah. has done it, right? It's it's uh, it's not it's something that some people thought about and created, and it still um, is there today. So that throughout the age of people, there are always people that make something great. Yeah, and now we have appropriate technology and eight hundred times more species than we had, in, you know, <laughs> a few hundred years ago. That's a lot of hope there. Um, today, those traditional systems are becoming tourist destinations <laughs> um, but we can emulate exactly the same principles and, and make them even more diverse and even more special so um, I'm, I'm trying to get people to realize this before it's too late thank you very much Jevlot. thank you for all that you shared today with us if our listeners or maybe first a word to you is there something that you would like to share with our listeners um, you need to have fun You know, what, when you're doing this, it should not be a hardship. It should be something that's engaging and meaningful, and it needs to be fun. If, you, if you're not having fun, you've got the design wrong, and we're all about design. And I talk about this all the time on my um, social media channels and websites. If you look up uh, Discover Permaculture, you'll find a lot of my work, and you'll see the examples I'm trying to explain here as quickly as possible. As well. Um, and you also, if people want to find out more about you, they say so Tuna Farm has a lot of information and you also mentioned your online courses. They're also available to everybody that yeah. wants to join. Discover Permaculture is the, the main link to my online courses. Zaytuna Farm is where I live in Australia. And Green in the Desert in Jordan is where I live when I'm in the Middle East. Nice one. And thank and you very much. New, huh? Oh, sorry. There's a new Yours. project in Hungary, which is going to help me in Hungary in the end of the month. We have a new project there that's wonderful. So a little bit closer to, I'll be teaching in Hungary as well. <laughs> a food forest course, an earthworks course, and an urban course in Hungary. It's a new evolving project, a wonderful project. So a little bit closer to Germany, that one. Nice one. Um, what will it be about? We have an urban one-day urban course in Budapest, and then on our project out on our we have some wonderful land um, out in the rural area. We'll be doing an earthworks course and a food forest course. Nice one. If I have time, I would like to join. Um, but for now, <laughs> thank you very much for the interview, Jeff. Um, I hope you have a great day, and maybe speak to you 
at another time at another be my pleasure anytime all right thank you thanks